schedule. I must uh, formally thank our speaker for taking time from a very busy schedule in a lab in Bangalore, and even more so for uh, enduring a fairly long uh, journey because of the fog. She's just come in from the airport, and uh, we couldn't even offer her a proper lunch. She just quickly grabbed a bite and, and joined us. It's a great privilege to welcome Dr. Omar Ramakrishnan, uh, who is with the National Center for Biological Sciences, Tata Institute of Fundamental Research in Bengaluru. Uh, before I formally introduce her, just a few small announcements. Uh, tomorrow we have a talk, uh, uh, sorry, on the 20th, which is Friday, we have a talk by Dr. Prem Chaudhary in the Rethinking History series on claiming inheritance, emerging patterns among women of Haryana. And on the 21st, which is Saturday, somewhat unusually, at 11 o'clock we have a panel discussion, India-China ties, 25 years after the Deng Rajiv talks, uh, 1989. Uh, this is being held uh, uh, in this room. Uh, it's at 11 a.m. in the morning. Uh, prior to that, at 10.30, there's a small tea to which all of you are cordially invited. This is being uh, put together in association with the Center for Policy Research, CPR. Uh, the uh, speakers are Ms. Jairam Ramesh, Minister for Rural Development, Shiv Shankar Menon, National Security Advisor, Ronan Sen, former Ambassador to the U.S., and Professor Alka Acharya of JNU. A couple of other announcements, uh, the NMML has published so far 57 occasional papers under the new series, History and Society, Perspectives in Indian Development and Samaj or Itihas. They are available at a nominal fee of 100 rupees. You can also download them from our website, www.nehrumemorial.nic.in. The History and Society recent papers include R.K. Devarama, Heroes and Histories, The Making of Rival Geographies of Tripura. And David Lerivel, Sir Sayyid, Maulana Azad, and the users of Urdu. In Perspectives in Indian Development, there's a very uh, uh, insightful paper coming out of an earlier public lecture actor, Pradeep Kumar Datta, Sri Niketan's Cooperatives, The Possibilities and Dilemmas of Vishwa Bharati's Globality. Samaj Eva Mitihas, it's a new series, it's in Hindi. Uh, there are two papers so far, Anamika, Hindi ke Sri Sahitya ka Ushakal, and Anirudh Deshpande, Cinema or Itihas Lekhan, Sambandh or Sambhavna. So, it's a privilege to uh, welcome an old friend, Dr. Omar Ramakrishnan, who studied population genetics for her doctorate in biological sciences at the University of California, San Diego. She then investigated genetic relationships between human populations in sub Saharan Africa and the genetic climate change response in small mammal populations during her postdoc research at Stanford. She started a molecular ecology lab at the National Center for Biological Sciences, CIFR, in 2005, where she is currently based. Dr. Ramakrishnan has been a member of the National Board for Wildlife uh, from 2010 to 2013. Uh, she has been a Ramanujan Fellow, and she is a DAE Outstanding Scientist. She was nominated as an Inc. Fellow in 2013. She writes that she is fascinated by trying to understand patterns that drive biodiversity in the Indian subcontinent, and she hopes to apply any knowledge gathered to the conservation of species. When we were discussing her talk, we did think about the tiger, but she then suggested a wider topic because the implications of her research go well beyond the tiger. It's a very intriguing title, and I'm sure you're as eager as I am to hear her talk. DNA Studies and Evolutionary History, Why Species Survival is More Than a Game of Numbers. Uh, mostly about tigers today, um, but <clears throat> maybe in the end I'll just tell you a little bit about where we are going and what we hope to uh, achieve in the years to come with, with this kind of understanding. So what I've done today is a little a traditional for myself. I've actually written out the talk. Uh, science talks, we usually just run around and talk at random. I thought it would be nice to actually uh, write it out for a change. So, um, you know, this is a picture of a tiger, which we, uh, which we saw in Kanha, and uh, if you can notice, there's uh, some scratch marks on his nose. Uh, so, this was an individual who was just involved in a, a territorial fight, and we saw the two animals kind of uh, going at each other, uh, just a few seconds, uh, you know, uh, for a few seconds. Uh, and, you know, and tigers definitely uh, enchant and fascinate us. They are the largest living carnivores, and like other such species, they have suffered significantly in a negative way uh, at the hands of humans. So wild tigers historically occurred between 70 degrees latitude and 100 degrees longitude, spanning 30 present-day nations and ranging from Armenia to Indonesia. 
So the point is that this is not a very specialist, you know, really finicky type of species which lives in only one location. It has a very broad geographical distribution, suggesting that it's quite a generalist. It can actually live and do quite well uh, in various kinds of habitats. And this uh, range included several habitats from the taiga and boreal forest. So imagine that, really cold locations, to tropical evergreen, moist, dry deciduous uh, forests, grasslands, and even mangroves. And his, in historical times alone, say in the last 200 or so years, we've witnessed a dramatic range collapse of 93% uh, for this species. So, uh, for example, this is just one map, and there are several others, which shows, uh, you know, uh, some of the kind of the light uh, colored dist historical distribution of the species and today's very kind of an optimistic idea of what today's distribution is. So um, most of this, uh, we think this loss of habitat has been because of loss of prey, prey depletion, habitat degradation and of course also direct hem hem uh, hunting. So just to emphasize this again, a species that could subsist at a wide variety of habitats is now restricted to 7% of its historical range. Now, global estimates of wild tiger populations range between 3,000 and 3,500 individuals. That's the estimate of wild tiger populations. And this is actually a really small number. The number of tigers on farms in Texas is something like 20 times this. So there's a lot of tigers out there in the world, but very, very few of them are actually wild. Uh, and and uh, of these, the Indian subcontinent actually harbors, you know, roughly between 50 to 60 percent of, of the global population. So about 2,000 of the wild tigers are actually uh, in the, the Indian subcontinent. And unfortunately, this is in about 8 to 25 percent of the remaining habitat. So 50 percent of the tigers living in less than 25 percent of global tiger habitat, okay? So they're all scrunched in uh, in the Indian subcontinent. So this means that the tigers in India are a significant proportion of the global population, making understanding of the dynamics of their populations an important part of understanding and thinking about species survival. So you've all heard uh, from Ulas Karans and uh, several uh, others, uh, and we, we have some information on the numbers of tigers. In fact, the last uh, not the last census, but the census before was quite dramatic. It was like an election poll, you know, with numbers, uh, you know, going up, like Ranthambur, 6, 7, 8, whatever. So it was a huge, uh, huge, and there's a huge focus on, on, on numbers and the numbers of tigers. Um, but we know very little, actually, about their evolution and their history. Um, and why is it important to actually understand uh, the history and evolution of Indian tigers? Well, we know that genetic variation... Our genes, our DNA, is the raw material for evolution and adaptation. So when we have a lot of genetic variants, that allows us to adapt or to withstand, you know, novel environmental change or diseases or challenges which nature kind of throws at us. And simply put, a population that is uh, characterized by high genetic variation will have a higher chance of survival uh, compared to one which has a lower amount of genetic variation. So unfortunately, until about eight years ago, we didn't have much information on the genetic variants of Indian tigers, uh, how much variation they have, uh, and more generally, anything about their history, uh, in, especially in the Indian subcontinent. So this is where I come in. So uh, as Mahesh mentioned, I'm trained as a population geneticist, someone who looks at genes and their frequencies. So for example, you can think of, say, eye color, uh, blue, gray, green, and black. Uh, the frequencies of genes, frequencies of these eye colors in different populations and why they may differ would be questions which fascinate a population geneticist. Uh, and we use this information then to try and reconstruct the history of, of populations. So I do this in the hope that such understanding will then allow us to think about the future. So in a sense, uh, I guess I study history, uh, with the history of species and populations, and I try to make uh, an informed judgment about how to move towards the future kind of given our understanding of the past. So now, when I started this, uh, uh, my, when I started my job about eight or nine years ago, I thought this would be an interesting thing uh, to do, to study the history of, of Indian tigers. Uh, and it actually was sparked off by a call from Ullas Karan, who said, you know, would you be interested in working on tigers? I just jumped at the opportunity. So in order to get, 
these data. So you need data. You need information. How do you get this information? You need uh, a biological source of information. You need DNA, right? So how do you get this DNA? Uh, well, you know, usually, I mean, if you've watched, I'm sure most of you don't watch television, but if you do, uh, and if you've watched shows like CSI or detective fiction, detective novels you've read, you know that, you know, people usually use uh, some something biological like, say, hair or, or blood or something like that, some, something which has cells and DNA. Uh, but you can imagine that getting blood or tissue from a wild tiger would be something really challenging, not just uh, in terms of actually catching the animal and all that stuff, but even getting permission. So logistically as well, this would be very difficult and formidable. And this is actually why studies on the tiger have been restricted in the past because no one would have, you know, the, uh, would be able to get permission for something like this with only, say, 2,000 animals left. So, so we decided to do something a little bit more creative. We actually uh, walked through the forest uh, and um, collected something which uh, most people wouldn't even want to talk about, especially on the dining table, tiger feces. So uh, it's amazing. I mean, you can walk through a forest, uh, not seeing a tiger at all, but be able to collect biological samples from individuals in that population. So we use tiger feces or poop uh, for some gory details. So tiger uh, feces passes through the intestine. You know, it pulls off cells as it does so, uh, and these cells have tiger DNA. So when we walk through the forest and we pick up this uh, tiger feces, we get a glimpse into the genetic makeup and kind of the story of an individual through its DNA. Of course, it's not easy. There's a lot of other DNA in that tiger feces. There is uh, plant DNA. There is prey DNA, whatever the tiger ate. Uh, in fact, right now in the lab, we're working on uh, a fecal sample from the proposed man-eating tiger. We've been asked by the forest department to ascertain whether there is human DNA in, in, the, in the fecal sample. Uh, hence, if we do find it, proving the tiger is man-eating. Um, but then, you know, we have to design specific sieves or uh, ways to kind of filter out what we don't want, which is the plants and the uh, prey, and actually just look only at the tiger DNA. <coughs> um, so, so once we do that, uh, we can actually read the story of the tiger from its DNA. And um, we did this. We walked across the Indian subcontinent, and we also had a lot of help from collaborators like Ullas Karans and others. And we actually found something really interesting. We found that uh, when compared to tigers outside the Indian subcontinent, Indian tigers retain 60 to 70 percent of the global uh, amount of genetic variation. Okay? So not only now are Indian tigers important from a demographic perspective, the fact that 60 percent of the global population is in India, just in terms of numbers, but in terms of genetic variance, this is also true. Indian tigers retain a large amount of genetic variation. Uh, the, uh, I, and the other thing that our results revealed, which was not really very popular, was the fact that tigers are not originally Indian. So we can actually uh, look at how, say, Indian tigers compare to tigers in other parts of the world, and we can look at how old uh, that variation is. So uh, does it seem like uh, the variation in Indian tigers is the oldest? suggesting that tigers are originally from India, right? Uh, and this is not the case. Uh, it turns out that kind of the oldest populations of tigers are the South China tigers. And this is also supported by fossil evidence uh, where, you know, there have been kind of ancestral tiger-looking things which have been uh, unearthed uh, in the South China area. But, you know, one could be suspicious of fossils simply because the Indian subcontinent is not a good place for fossilization. But our results kind of resubstantiated what people had thought of based on fossil evidence, that tigers are not Indian. Uh, tigers originated in some place like South China, and then possibly as a sec part of a secondary range expansion moved into the Indian subcontinent. So this was not something which people were very happy with. Uh, I, in fact, once met a journalist who said, but uh, the tiger is a national animal. I mean, how can it be from China? So anyway, I mean, I think... Uh, the fact remains, though, that uh, a lot of tiger genetic variation is in the Indian subcontinent. This is possibly because we have a very wide variety of habitats that it inhabits here. Right? So uh, our analysis also reveals something interesting about a relatively recent history. And this is uh, something which we probably knew, 
uh, but it was very cool to see it uh, with the DNA. So this is actually just to show you uh, what our results look like. But uh, on the on the on this side, uh, we have a plot of uh, what the population size of tigers was. Uh, and the first question we ask of the data is: Has it been constant? Has it been unchanging through time? And the answer to that question is no. There seems to have been some kind of a, a switch in population size. Uh, and in this case, because uh, it turns out to be a decline, uh, so the pre-decline size, uh, this is the genetic number of tigers, is higher, this is the log scale, uh, by tenfold compared to the post-decline size. So just based on, you know, little blips of genes and their frequencies, we are able to reconstruct uh, that population sizes of tigers have declined. And we can also try to statistically time this decline. And it turns out that this decline, uh, I mean, the median, of course, there's variance about this estimate, uh, but the median estimate is about 200 years ago. So what, what these analyses uh, would indicate to us, what we infer from them, is that populations of tigers started declining about 200 years ago, and they declined to one-tenth of their historical size. So, of course, people have, we know this, we know that tiger populations have declined. I said that in my first slide. But, you know, uh, it's, it's kind of fascinating to see this simply from, and, you know, Mahesh and others have, have kind of made, uh, made very much more detailed calculations based on historical records about how much uh, decline there might have been and so on. But it's, it's fascinating to see that we can detect something like this from a completely a different source of information, in a sense, yeah? So what we know, what do we know so far? We know the tigers did not evolve in India. So the, proportion, the populations here within a large proportion of the species variation. And this is despite a 90% decline in their population sizes about 200 years ago. So then we were very curious whether, you know, we clearly have lost habitat as well, right? I started off by saying that we only retain 7% of the range. So is it just numbers that we have lost, or have we lost particular kinds of tigers which were there in the past and which we don't really have among us anymore today? So we asked, is numbers all that we have lost? So how do you do this? I really want to ask a question about historical tigers, a question about tigers which were alive in the past. Then I have to go back in time. I have to go back to the past. Uh, and actually, the amazing thing is that with DNA, you can do this. Because DNA, unlike, say, proteins which make up our hair, uh, is very stable. And, you know, uh, you might have seen in the newspaper reports of, you know, the sequencing of the Neanderthal genome. I mean, that's pretty amazing that you can actually get the whole instruction manual of something which went extinct several, several thousands of years ago. So what we did was not that, uh, not that uh, amazing, but we went uh, to the London Museum of Natural History, which has the best collection of geo-referenced, temporally referenced uh, pets. So basically they know, they have, uh, you know, tiger skins, which they know where they are from and when they were killed. They were mostly there because they were hunted, right? And what we did is uh, we tried to sample areas where tigers are currently extirpated. We tried to focus on areas the tigers are no longer present. This is just an example of a, of a skin uh, from the London Museum. This is a 200-year-old skin from Afghanistan. So we really tried to get areas like Afghanistan and Pakistan where tigers are no longer present today, you know, in this, those set arid parts. Um, and this is just to show you uh, a map with, you know, the modern sampling locations which are, in, uh, which are in black, black dots, and the historical which are actually the red dots. Um, so we actually managed to get 53 samples. And we, again, extracted DNA from these samples. Uh, we just take a small piece of DNA about this big, uh, and we actually, uh, you know, chop it up very finely, uh, and then, you know, we just extract DNA from it, as we would do from a scat sample, for example. Uh, and then uh, we asked, how does the historical radiation compare to modern genetic radiation? And what we found uh, quite surprised us. I'm sorry, it's a little bleached out. But uh, basically, this is just a figure which, which shows variation. It's just a descriptive figure. And these, these bonds are basically, you know that DNA is basically made up of letters. So we're, let's say we're reading a word, okay, of some length. And each of these balls is a unique spelling. So it's a unique genetic variant. 
uh, and you know the connections between them are potentially how they're connected to each other. And uh, if if all we had lost was numbers, then really lost uh, genetically unique tigers, then the blue balls and the red balls would be you know shared. The spellings would be the same, right? So there would be balls which was blue and red. But what we see in this in this figure is most of the times the blue and the red seem to exclude each other, right? Uh, and what this means, actually, the overlap is very, very minimal. So what this actually uh, suggested to us is that we have lost a large proportion of, we have lost a lot of genetic variation, okay? Um, so, uh, I mean, I think this is significant. I think to me what was even more significant was uh, that our analysis actually suggested something else. So remember I was talking to you about, you know, these uh, samples from here. So, and uh, this is, so if you just look at, um, if you also use the, you use the data and you ask the data, what are populations of tigers or what are groups, cohesive groups of individuals? Who are the cohesive groups of individuals and how do they map on to space? Uh, what do you find? So this is what we find today, that there are three groups of populations of tigers. Amazingly, all of peninsular India and maybe the northeast. I'm not very confident of this result because our sample size is poor, but uh, this whole bit hangs together as one population. The Sarai separates out, and so does the semi-arid population. Now, interestingly, in the past, it appears that there were actually two populations. The Sarai and the semi-arid were connected, uh, and, you know, the peninsula of India was still, even at that point, uh, one group. So I'm not sure why this is. I'm not sure whether it's because, you know, we, uh, because of, I mean, one possibility is a large loss of habitat in, uh, due to agriculture and stuff like that in places like uh, Punjab and so on. I don't know whether that is what has cut off, uh, you know, the semi-arid from the Sarai. But basically what we are seeing is that in the last um, 200 years, right, in the last 200 years, we are witnessing the breakup of populations in a sense. The, the breakup of connectivity or connections between groups of tigers. So, so anyway, I mean, basically, like I said, in the past, the semi-arid populations appear to be connected to the Sarai, and all of Peninsular India was connected. But now, the semi-arid population seems to be cut off. Uh, and it could be, this could be what we think. We're not sure of why this is the case. But you know, this genetic information is uh, based on mitochondrial DNA, which is something you get from your mother. So it's like your female lineage, right? And uh, there's some information uh, on behavioral, uh, you know, data on tigers, which suggests that daughters actually inherit the territories of their mothers. Males tend to move much more than do females. So if if that is the case, then over time, a particular female lineage will become associated with a patch of forest or wildland, right? And so if you lose that patch of forest or you lose that habitat, uh, you might be at risk of losing that particular genetic variant. So we think that that's what might have been happening here. But basically, even if you just go back to this, uh, you know, you can imagine that suppose you just erased off with the eraser all the blues, right? Immediately the connections in this network weaken. Uh, and just intuitively you would guess that these populations become more different from each other than they were in the past. Okay, so uh, so basically stepping back, this deconstruction shows us that also what is interesting is, well, the semi-arid tigers are politically much celebrated. That there are some boar tigers, you know. I mean, I have nothing against them; they're very beautiful. But you know, they are the quintessential tigers, right? And now the semi-arid population is one maybe two populations. The Sariska tigers are simply those reintroduced from Ransambore right now. The original tigers there are extinct. So what is the future for this semi-arid population? I don't know, but uh, certainly a bit uh, dimmer compared to that of any tigers that live in the peninsula of India. So, so anyway, so we already see a change in connectedness between populations. In the last 200 years, we've also lost genetic variants. Uh, if we simply retain the genetic variation we have into the future, if we simply wanted to retain, so, okay, so we've already lost tigers, we've already lost variation, 
We've lost a lot of habitat. So how do we move forward? What do we do next, right? So, so we wanted to ask this question in different ways. So, okay, suppose we just want to retain the existing amount of genetic radiation. We don't want to uh, increase it, but just retain whatever we have. How many tigers do we need? Okay. So, you know, we are always trying to achieve targets, right? So maybe we can think about targets for conservation and management. Uh, can we say that if we had, you know, 10 times as many tigers as we have today, we would be okay, at least at the same level we are today. We're not doing better, we're not doing worse. Can we do this kind of an analysis? Uh, and can we pitch this against connectivity? So if we had disconnected versus connected populations, would our answer be different? So just put provocatively, can we retain genetic variation by increasing numbers alone or must we maintain connectivity between populations? So we did this as well and of course we can't go forward in time, we can kind of go backwards in time and so we did this with uh, computer simulations of tigers and their genes uh, and our results revealed that in the absence of population connectivity, so this is uh, just a figure from that paper which is actually just accepted, uh, that in the absence of population connectivity, the numbers of tigers required to maintain current genetic variation is so high, it's simply not a realistic or feasible conservation target. So this actually shows how we did, so we've actually done it for the whole tiger range and we've said uh, there's these different populations. So if you look at it at the species level, where you have, you know, Sumatran, Malay, and Bengal, Indo-Chinese, etc. Um, if you had, panmixia simply means kind of, complete mixing, okay? So, when you, if you have panmixia, and this is a historical estimate of how many tigers there were, the number of tigers you would need in 2150 is not very, very high. This number is not very high. But if you maintain these as very, as separate populations, the number would be about 6 lakh. So, that's unrealistic, uh, given the habitat that is remaining. If you look at this at the scale of Peninsular India, a smaller scale, maybe a more uh, tangible scale, we, we, I don't know whether we can think about mixing or movement between, you know, Southeast Asia and the Indian subcontinent. Uh, again, you see that with mixing, the number of tigers you, you need is not really much, much higher than you even have today, uh, as long as there are, there are connections that are being maintained. So, so basically, uh, I mean, in a sense, uh, if we are able to maintain connections between populations, the numbers of tigers we need is greatly offset and we need much more tigers in each population. And if you think about it, it kind of makes sense. Uh, you can imagine <coughs> tigers circulating across large spaces would have a large amount of genetic variation. Uh, but if you had to pack the same amount of variation into one population, you would need a lot more tigers. So it's not something very... Uh, fantastically novel, it's just that, you know, saying it in the context of a real species, uh, and, uh, and actually the, the methods we use are, are a little bit different, uh, but, you know, saying it in the context of a real species kind of hits much harder. So where do we go from here now? We know that Indian type, <coughs> the Indian subcontinent is the region, should be the region of focus for conservation efforts, given that there are more tigers and more variation here. The tiger populations have declined here substantially in the last 200 years. The populations are less connected today than they were in the past. And the population connections are critical to maintaining genetic viability of tigers into the future. So, of course, a critical step then is to address how far tigers are moving today. I mean, our data suggests that this is one group, but we've not really looked at movement, have we? We've just said the genetic data indicate mixing, okay? So, can we do this? Well, we gave it a shot, um, and we tried to address this question in the central Indian landscape. How far are tigers moving between protected areas today? So, again, we walked through several protected areas and investigated whether individual tigers found in a location were genetically from there or from somewhere else, okay? That's how we approach the question. This is almost like forensics. We tried to figure out which tigers in an area were native in a genetic sense and which were immigrants. Our genetic data was actually spectacular. This is probably for my, I mean, it's not the best published work from our lab, 
but uh, to my mind, the most beautiful data which uh, has actually come out of the lab. So this is actually worked by a master's student uh, from the master's program, which Mahesh also teaches in, Aditya Joshi. Um, and this is, uh, again, bleached out, but showing you uh, the central Indian landscape. The reason we chose it is, see, unlike the Western Ghats, which is quite linear, you know, and there's quite a lot, uh, quite a lot of possibility for connectivity, the central Indian landscape is pretty fractured. And there's a lot of proposed development in this area. So it would be, it was nice to think about it from this perspective. Uh, so we had basically uh, populations from Anza. This is a very critical player in our study, Nagarjun Sagar Sri Salem, a kind of ignored, much maligned, but getting much more popular now <laughs> population. Uh, I, I don't mean to be uh, fantastic, but it's, uh, some populations get much more attention than others. And then, you know, Kanha. Uh, very much a jewel, whatever population, uh, and others like Taroba and so on and so forth. And this is just to show you what the data look like, just as a flavor. So basically on, on this axis here, we have uh, the location where the tiger was, the sample was collected, and this color basically indicates genetically the location the tiger is from, okay? So basically you can see, for example, if you look at Taroba, uh, all Taroba, all uh, scat samples and tigers sampled in Taroba seem to be Tarobian. They seem to be genetically native. There are some which we cannot assign. So this guy, for example, which is half purple, we would say we don't know what that is. We only accept as immigrants those individuals which are 95% another color. So for example, uh, this, uh, this individual here, uh, has been uh, sampled in male ghats, but genetically is from KTR, which is Kanha. Okay, so we did this, uh, and it's called an assignment test. So we did this to actually look for uh, which individuals are kind of migrating or immigrants. And uh, and clearly, you know, there's a this is a preliminary study. We need to do a lot more. The sample sizes are low, but um, what we found was pretty spectacular, at least to me. So what we found this. This figure here shows the the movers, right? And it's amazing that there seems to be uh, on the order of six, 600 kilometers distance movement, okay? And uh, what's also really interesting is that certain populations in this scheme seem to be bus stops, depots, where individuals are going in and out. Uh, and for a long time, you know, people like Ulas and others have talked about source sync dynamics. Certain populations chewing out individuals because they are good in terms of the number of prey. They're, they're, for whatever reason, they are good populations, robust populations. And we actually saw this. Uh, and one of those is Kanha. Kanha is an amazing place. It has a very high density of ungulates. Uh, a very large number of different species live there. Uh, and it's pretty amazing to see that Kanha is really the bus stop, the b major player in this dynamic. But so is Nagarjun Sagar Sri Salem. Now, Nagarjun Sagar Sri Salem is not a very good place, quote-unquote. Uh, there's not very high prey density. Uh, but there's various ideas in ecology as to why dispersal may occur. So dispersal or movement could occur, say, if the place is very good, there's not enough space and you move out, or if it's bad, there's not enough resources there, so you try and move somewhere else. So so anyway, so, so basically... Uh, we also then investigated something else. We wanted to know whether we could actually predict uh, movement. So it's fine to see, okay, there's movement and it's on a large distance scale. So just to put this in perspective, uh, camera trap studies, for example, have showed, uh, for example, Ullas Karans and others have been working in the Western Ghats for over 15 years, and they have shown an individual, you know, photographed in one location, photographed again 300 kilometers away. Okay, so people have shown this kind of dispersal, uh, but uh, this is the longest which has been uh, kind of proposed. This is, doesn't prove it because I haven't caught the same animal, but it suggests it, uh, and this is probably the longest distance that we, we know of so far of, uh, for movement for tigers. Others have, for example, studied uh, suggested connectivity between paint and kanha. This is a hot topic for debate because of the national highway which runs through there, uh, our studies and others. Uh, what were um, kind of proposed to uh, to kind of stall this development, but it's still happening anyway. So so anyway, so we wanted to know whether we can predict 
why or when tigers are actually moving. And we did this by uh, using what's called a resistance-based approach. So basically, uh, based on the landscape, which is between, say, here and here, we construct, uh, you know, imagine current moving through this landscape, okay? And each population outputs current, puts out some current. Now, it can only flow to the next uh, node if there is uh, not very high resistance. If the resistance is too high, it would get damped out, and you will not have tiger movement. So we asked what features of the landscape correlate with tiger movement. And what we found, uh, surprisingly or maybe not, is that the strongest uh, negative impacts on movement are that of human footprints. So human development in terms of human settlements, and we assessed this using uh, data on nightlights, and I'll show you a picture of that. Uh, as well as things like linear barriers like roads and so on. So things like agricultural fields didn't seem to matter, okay? And if you think about it, again, intuitively, it seems to make sense. We often hear of, uh, of uh, lepers and elephants wandering into Mysore city and so on and so forth, wandering into large urban areas, but you don't really hear of tigers doing this. We hear of tigers hiding in the bushes, living, you know, close to agricultural fields, feeding on stuff. But you don't really hear of them, you know, kind of walking boldly into cities. So maybe this is a, a real behavioral uh, nugget of information. We don't know yet. Uh, like I said, uh, it's just an initial study and we'd like to learn more. So given all of this, how do we move forward? And I, I want to show you a couple of things. This is a protected area map of the Indian subcontinent. 4% of our land area is under protection. Okay? That's it. These are small blips in the landscape, okay? Uh, and this is a map of night lights of the, Indian, of, of the world, actually. Uh, and you can see that there in India, bright as can be, you know, lots of people, lots of people have always been here. In fact, that's one of the reasons why we suspect that actually we find it in many species that the Sarai populations are quite different from Perindar India. Maybe there have been people in the Gangetic Plains for very, very long. So there have been people in India for long, and the projections are that, uh, you know, uh, in the next 40 years, 60% of India might be urban. Okay, so 4% of our land area is protected, and soon 60% of India will be urban. So will tigers be able to navigate these increasingly urban landscapes? That's the question. So we're now trying to tackle this question at the scale of Peninsular India. I've uh, just been fascinated by the fact that, you know, this is, again, sorry, bleached out, but basically, um, you know, there's kind of three sets uh, of areas, you know, in this big Peninsular Indian landmass. One is the Central Indian landscape, uh, right in the middle, Nagarjun Sagar, Sri Salem, and the Southern landscape, or the, the Western Ghats landscape. Right? So, um, so, while our study of, of Central India was very interesting and tantalizing, it gave us a few nuggets of information. But to move forward, we need to understand more about movement at the scale of a tiger population, not just between one or two places, right? Uh, and in our ongoing and future work, we are hoping to do this. So, as I speak, my student who is actually getting tests for malaria, hopefully she's fine, uh, and she was working in uh, Satpura. Uh, but, you know, uh, we are hoping to survey 15 protected areas between MP and Kerala, collecting tiger cats and DNA from all these areas to look for connectivity, to understand what factors are driving connectivity uh, in this landscape, and what are key uh, determinants of tiger movement. We hope that such answers will help guide development efforts outside PAs. We are trying to work as fast as we can. It's hard. I mean, it takes a long time to get these data. But, you know, development is much faster. So we need to be fast. Um, we also hope, we also then hope to model and analyze these populations in the context of proposed development. So we didn't do a very, so far we've just done very, like, big picture type of stuff. We've not done anything very detail-oriented. So if we have some idea of proposed development, say, in the Central Indian landscape, maybe alternative models of development, we can't say no entirely, but if there are alternative possibilities, maybe we can assess, 
you know, using our backer information and simulations, what might be a better option compared to something else. Um, and we hope to answer questions about this network, this particular area network. Are sets of particular areas in the landscape that are connected more important than others, for example? I'm guessing already that Nagarjun Sagar Sri Sailam is critical. If indeed this whole set of populations is one kind of continuous thing, then of course this guy is critical. So can we actually put it in a very, um, uh, like a framework where we say this population is 10 times as important as this one or something like that, which may be a bit easier to understand uh, from a policy perspective. Um, and is it possible to assess the impact of, say, developing this highway versus that? I've been in, uh, so like I mentioned, you know, Adikta was presented uh, for the Spanish uh, Kanha stuff. We've also predict, uh, presented data uh, against opening up of mines outside Satpura. But, you know, some of the questions we got were, does it matter if the road is, you know, here or there? And there's no way we have any information or knowledge to answer those types of questions from a scientific perspective. I can ima answer emotionally, of course. So, uh, before I conclude, I'd just like to add that this is just one, this is actually the work of one PhD student mostly, uh, and a master's student, and another, actually the simulations, the future simulations is, uh, were done by a graduate student at Stanford. Um, but, you know, we are trying to actually do this now for the whole of the Indian subcontinent and its species. We're trying to reconstruct the history of many Indian mammals. And we think this is interesting because we believe, or we, we think, we don't believe, uh, we hypothesize that mammals are relatively recent entrants to the Indian subcontinent. So uh, the Indian landmass was part of this much land, much larger, uh, huge landmass called Pangea Gondwana, and it broke away and did the longest journey of any landmass uh, in history, uh, you know, when it hit, came and hit Asia about 40 million years ago. And so we think that, you know, just as we found with tigers, the tigers evolved in China, South China, and moved into India. Maybe this is a general paradigm. Maybe most mammals we have have come from the outside. And, of course, this throws us against the gateway to the Indian subcontinent, which is basically the Himalaya and the Northeast. Again, fascinating uh, and a little challenging places to work. So I hope I get to share this story with you sometime, maybe when it's better developed in a few years. So just to sum up what I think and believe strongly for tigers. So I strongly believe that the future of tigers as a species depends on how we are able to safeguard their populations within the Indian subcontinent. The science so far suggests that while it is critical to protect populations and increase the number of tigers within protected areas, the evolutionary viability of tigers within uh, evolutionary viability of tigers can only be achieved by maintaining the ability for animals to move between areas. This puts the burden of conservation and management not on what we do inside protected areas, but outside. In a country with high population density and tremendous development needs, how we develop this landscape outside will impact whether tigers are locked into their habitat islands or able to travel long distances, as we know they are doing today. The thought that, you know, tigers are moving 500, 600 kilometers, it's enough to give you goosebumps. Um, and I hope that the science that we are doing will provide on-ground gui guidelines for development and that such information and subsequent policy intervention might help towards tiger survival in the future. Thanks. Thank you for a fascinating uh, lecture. It's uh, always uh, a treat to listen to. Uh